good morning, and welcome to English Sunday's worship service at St. Anne's in St. Petersburg. Today is the, thir thir uh, the 13th Sunday of the Trinity season, the season of the church year after Pentecost when we are reminded of all that Jesus did and taught. The anchoring theme today focuses on, on our neighbor, loving our neighbor. In the Old Testament lesson for today from the prophet Hosea, Hosea, in a sense, mourns over Israel, which has forsaken the mercy and love for God, and therefore forsaken his mercy and their love for each other. How God has, you know, tried to call them and they haven't listened. Uh, in our epistle lesson from 1 John, God reminds us that as he first loved us, we are called to love others. And this, I suppose, we can get into a debate about what love is, especially in a world <laughs> Today that has subverted, even perverted the definition of love, but as Christians we understand that love does mean caring, but it doesn't necessarily mean agreeing. Um, but we won't go there today. Uh, in our gospel lesson we have Jesus answering two questions. What does one have to do to inherit eternal life? And who is our neighbor? And we will hear once more the parable of the Good Samaritan. So let us begin now, then, by singing our first hymn, hymn number 913.
But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Beloved in the Lord, let us turn here with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And for his sake, forgives us all of our sins. In the 20th chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus gives to his disciples and through them to his church the power to forgive sins in his name and by his authority. Therefore, I promise your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. shall be saved. Grant this Lord unto us all. We will now read responsibly by verses Psalm number 70, found at the beginning of the hymn. Let's Make haste, O God, to, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be sure to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let them be turned back and brought to dishonor who desire my hurt. Let them turn back because of their shame, who say, Aha, aha. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. But I am poor in thee. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer, O God. Do not delay.
Let us pray. All powerful and eternal God, who has opened for us your eternal and true love, we pray. Through your Holy Spirit, help us reject from our hearts all hate and apathy, and rather love each other not only in word, but also in truth and deed, just as you have loved us through Jesus Christ our Lord, your beloved Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Please be seated now as we have our readings. Our Old Testament reading for today is taken from the prophet Hosea, the sixth chapter, beginning at the fourth verse. O Ephraim, what shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud, and like the early dew it goes away. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and your judgments are like light that goes forth. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson for today is taken from the from the first John, the first, first uh, fourth chapter, beginning at the sixteenth verse. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Please rise. And Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. Alleluia. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he, he said, he who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let us not confess our common Christian faith in the words of the Nicene. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, 
And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and look for the direction of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated now as we sing our next hymn, hymn number 700.
Once more we gather to hear God's word, and today, once more we hear what uh, we should all know and what we should now live by, um, the sum of the law and the prophets. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Sums up both tables of the law, loving God, how to love our neighbor. The Ten Commandments are summed up in those words. We hear that today as a young lawyer says it, as Jesus says, how do you read the law, right? The situation is this, a lawyer, meaning one trained up in the Jewish law, uh, the religious moral law and moral laws of Moses, comes to Jesus with a question to test him. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Although the question might be considered, most of those we see it's a test, right? Most of those interpret this passage as a test, but it says right there. To test the orthodoxy of Jesus, is he teaching properly? To bring some sort of charge against him. Now Jesus does not answer the question put to himself, himself, but he rather turns the question back on the young lawyer. What does the law say? How do you read it? How do you understand it? And the lawyer answers with what we just said. The sum of the law and the prophets. Love your neighbor, love God, love your neighbor. And to this Jesus responds by saying, perfectly keep this law and we'll inherit eternal life. You'll live. Do this and you will live. Now confronted with this, but the lawyer realizes that he is not necessarily in line to inherit eternal life. Since he is falling short, keeping the law, he has just summed up. This is evident because he seeks to justify himself by asking, who is my neighbor? Like any lawyer, I suppose, he's looking for some wiggle room in the law. Right? Where is he good at this? Where's the loophole? Where can I find, how can I manipulate the law or interpret the law in such a way that you know, uh, I can use it to my benefit? Now, there are mitigating circumstances somehow I can cite that would still allow him, he wants to know, that he can still inherit, inherit eternal life somehow. <laughs> so who's my neighbor? There's got to be a way out of this somehow. Jesus responds to the attempt to self-justify with what has been known, become known as the parable of the Good Samaritan. And even outside of Christian circles, people will understand what's a Good Samaritan because it's so well known that even non-Christians know that term. And Jesus basically then confronts the lawyer with this church, your, your, this truth. Your neighbor is everyone. You are called to show love to them. You are called to show love to everyone. And not only that, you are called to show love to them by helping them in their need, not at your convenience, regardless of how busy you are, even if you are busy with God's work. If you are to keep the law and live from our commands, you are to show love to your neighbor in all circumstances, in any place, and at all times, your neighbor is in need. No excuses, no loopholes, no mitigating circumstances. Our test poses another question and reveals another answer. After the parable then asks, Jesus asks the lawyer, who acted as a neighbor to the man? Indeed, and the lawyer admits that the one who showed mercy to him, the one who stopped, stooped down, and cared for the robbed and beaten man. So as much as Jesus commands the young man to go in the likewise, you know, we do not hear the young lawyer's response. And this is because his response is really not that important. Maybe for him it would be, but for us it's not. What is important is how we respond. Can we truly also do likewise, like the Samaritan? Can we fulfill our Lord's command fully? Given that Jesus has said what he has said, how do we stand before our Lord and God? Obviously, we have not kept the law. We have not loved God so completely, and this is evident because we have not at all times no place to love our neighbor as ourselves. Notwithstanding what else the parable teaches, this meaning of the parable stands. We are called to love our neighbor, help our neighbor. And this, our Lord's command, is simple and clear, even if it is impossible for us to Faced with the command, we would then struggle. Do I stop on the road and help that stranger driver, or is it some kind of trick? How do I respond to the beggars on the streets in the metro who ask for money? You know, if they're just going to give it to them, they're going to get drunk or whatever. You know, how do I deal with this? And we start to, you know, 
think? What do we do when we start to struggle? And all this is important because as much as this internal wrestling with God's word and law is important because it helps us grow in faith, so it's, it is important. However, if this is the crux of our Lord's teaching, if this is the end of what he means, the parable, if there is nothing more in Jesus' teaching than a discourse on how we are to fulfill the law, then none of us stand to inherit eternal life. We are lost. Like the man beaten and left to die on the side of the route to Jericho Road, we are left and beaten by sin and guilt and destined to die. As clear as Jesus' call is to show love to all those in need, there is more to his teaching in this parable than just keep the law. The key to understanding this parable, I think, more deeply is found when the lawyer admits that the one who is the neighbor is the one who shows mercy. As much as this teaching of the parable guides us in our lives here to love our neighbor, Jesus points to a deeper eternal truth, the truth that points us to the only source of justification before the law, his mercy and his grace. If we go back to the occasion from which this parable arises, in this case, the story is a question given by a lawyer, someone who knew well the Ten Commandments and the requirements of the Old Covenant, and he asks, how do I inherit eternal life? The question at least shows an understanding that there is eternity, and that eternity has two outcomes. Eternal life in the kingdom of God or eternal life in hell. For many of those today, people choose to ignore the question of their destiny in eternity, and worse yet, deny the existence of hell. So Jesus' answer here to the lawyer does clarify that there is eternal life and eternal death. We can't get around it. It does make that clear. We can live as not to attain eternal life. What is more, the only way to obtain it is to fulfill God's law, right? To obtain it, live up to God's standard of righteousness. Love the Lord your God with your whole heart, not withholding anything from Him. And then love your neighbor as yourself, which means without selfishness or self interest. But the lawyer misses the point. Although he doesn't misunderstand it, he falls short. The lawyer knows scripture, but he misses the point like so many of the other Jewish leaders of Jesus' day and like many Christians today, who search scripture, seeing the Bible mainly as a rule book to guide their lives by. And although there is guidance in scripture and although those things are important for us to learn, the center of Holy Scripture is what? Rules or Jesus himself? Jesus Christ and what he has done for you and all sinners. Remember what Jesus says in John 5, 39 to the Pharisees and the scribes. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But these are they that testify of me. Before the reading of the gospel read to him, we read the verse also from John 6. The work of God is this. To believe first in him who he sent. Jesus also teaches his disciples his truth in Luke 24, right? In the beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Jesus expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. If we don't understand that Jesus is the center of scripture instead of rules or something else, we miss the point. Jesus himself makes clear that all scripture, all of God's word, points to him as the Savior, as the Christ. And this includes then his own teaching. In this light, we look at the parable not as simply centered on a moral story or teaching on how, how to be good. And all of the teaching is there. That's not the main point. Because we can also then see that Jesus is in this parable. That this parable is also about Jesus and what he does for us. In that case, then, we see it's Jesus who does keep the law. He certainly loves his Father above all things, and therefore is perfectly obedient, so obedient that he comes in human flesh and takes on death on the cross. Obedient unto death. And clearly he loves his neighbor as himself, if not even more, because his neighbor is who? You and me. And he loves us so much he loves you and me so much to such a degree that he fulfills the law for us, the law we cannot fulfill, and then takes our sin with him on the cross, bearing our judgment, 
our punishment, so that through faith in him, we do then and may then inherit eternal life. And then we see this parable as more than just a call to be do-gooders. Understanding Jesus as the center of the story, we then see that the true Good Samaritan is not you, the true Good Samaritan is not I, but it is Jesus himself. You and I are the beaten man by the side of the world. Hopefully we're not the thieves or are beating other people. That'd be bad. That'd be even worse. But no, we're the most likely the man beaten by the side of the road, attacked and robbed in our relationship with our Creator God, our Father, and our eternal life, by Satan and his henchmen, by our own sinfulness and the sinfulness and the wickedness of the world around us. We are beaten by guilt and shame of sin and left on the side of the road to die helpless and naked, and rightly so, because it's the road we chose to travel. Worldly religion and the institution of the church and religions do not save. They pass by. Religious people, all of those who hope to save themselves by the works of piety, fulfilling ritual or church membership, is also not what saves, not what helps. Such people are often those are too busy and too worried about their own problems or so concerned that they might somehow besmirch their holiness that they're afraid to get their hands dirty. Associating with people who are fallen sinners. Yet it is a despised one, right? The rejected one. As such were Samaritans to the Jewish people, right? The Samaritans, if you know anything at all, the Samaritans were the people who the Jews looked down on. They called them dogs. And uh, not very nice. So the Samaritans were despised and rejected people, and it's the one who's despised and rejected who stoops down to help us. Those who are, in fact, his enemies. Because this is Jesus himself, right, who comes to save us. He who, as the prophet says, was rejected by us. When we were yet sinners, when we were yet rebellious against God, yet in our rebellion, he comes to save us. This is Jesus who comes, even though we hated him so much that we crucified him. Can't blame anybody else. Even though we have done our best often to avoid him, and going out of our way is to not cross paths with him, he meets us on the road, recognizes our sinfulness, sees that we will die unless he comes and helps us, and he pulls us out of the ditch of our sin and death into which the devil and the world are sin has thrown us. Jesus Christ, God himself, pulls us out of the ditch in which we are going to die, pours the balm of his blood on our wounds of sin, heals them, heals his wounds in our soul left by the sin of the devil, and he takes us in his arms, carries us, and cares for us, and pays in full the price for our healing. This is the key lesson the parable teaches us, that we have a neighbor who is Jesus Christ himself who did not spare even his own life, his own body and blood, that we might be saved and inherit eternal life. With this in mind, then, Jesus called into the parable to go and do like, to go and do likewise, takes on also a deeper meaning. The call to love our neighbor means not just doing good for them, but also doing good for them on the eternal level, right? The spiritual level, the material and temporal of being a witness and a way to minister to the eternal needs that we see. We are called to love those around us because they are as we are. People who have had their souls beaten by Satan and sin and are dying of their wounds by the side of the road of life. People around you, people you meet every day, even those people who you'd rather avoid, or especially those who maybe hate you and don't like you, these are the people who are your neighbor and who need to hear of the safe salvation in Jesus Christ. These are the people who will die their sin unless someone stop and give their souls aid, the good news of forgiveness and reconciliation that is only through Christ. So first we learn of Jesus' love for us and our salvation, and then we hear God's call to love those around us, not only by ministering to their momentary physical needs in this life, but more so their spiritual wounds, by giving them the comfort and healing of God's, His Word, inviting them to the balm of baptism, to bring them to the end, his church, where they might hear the healing word that really might be healed. On the cross, Jesus paid in full not 
only for your healing, but for those people too, their healing. It's all paid for, it's all done. They just don't know it, or they don't want it, but it's there. He did all of this because of his love for you and his love for them. And so that you and they might inherit eternal life with him. This is showing mercy. This is showing love. And not just for the results of this life, but for eternal, to inherit eternal life. Through faith in him, we believe in the one whom God has sent to heal our wounds, set us free from sin, death, and the power of the devil, to be our savior, to justify us, because we cannot justify ourselves. And so now we the peace of the Lord's past understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and the life everlasting. Amen. <laughs> Guide them and help them to be faithful servants and stewards of the task to which you have called them. We especially lift up to our Bishop Yvonne, who is uh, a 
undergoing some medical treatment that he would you know, guide the doctors, give them wisdom, and heal him so that he might be returned to strength to serve you and serve this church. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Amen. Almighty God, Lord of heaven and earth, who establishes wars and governments as your means to bring order to this world, grant wisdom to all who hold authority here. We especially pray for President Putin. We also pray for U.S. President Biden, Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau, Scottish Prime Minister Stoff, and Finnish President Minas, and NATO General Secretary Jens Stoltenberg. Guide and go on diplomatic channels for negotiations so that the fighting in the Ukraine will not expand, but would rather lead to a true and fair peace in the Ukraine. We also pray for the electoral process in the USA that you would use it to raise up candidates and ultimately leaders that would be men after your own heart. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Heavenly Father, who sees every sparrow that falls, who lift up to you all those who are suffering because of the continued conflict in Ukraine. For those in school, those on the front and the border regions, for all the refugees, soldiers, and their families, all those living in fear and uncertainty and experiencing the loss of property and loved ones, we cry out to you that in your mercy you would shorten this conflict so that the suffering and blood may cease, peace and harmony might be reestablished, sanctions against the Russian people be lifted, and the reconciliation between nations be Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, who commands us to teach your law and mercy and grace to our children, we pray for the work of open movement schools here in Russia. And we also pray for the ministry of the International Academy and blessings on the leadership, uh, the new leadership at the Emmanuel Lutheran School of Preaching. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Creator God, who first and foremost created us male and female in your image, we bring before your throne the craziness of the world today and all those crap and beguiled and sexual identity, false understandings of love, marriage, and relationships. Strengthen those in your church to be positive witnesses to your love, the goodness of your created order, so that somehow we might stem the tide that this seems to be overtaking in this world. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Merciful, gracious, loving God. We bring before you all who are in trouble, want sickness, and struggle with faith, or any other adversity, especially those who are suffering for your name's sake. We bring before you Yvonne, Sergey, Steve, Morton, Kathy, Dane, Vera, Galia, Darina, and Bart, Eugenia, and all those we name in our hearts now. In your hands, O Lord, commend all for whom we pray, trusting your mercy to grant us all good things according to your will for the sake of the bitter suffering and death. Of Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Please be seated now as we sing our next hymn, hymn number 571.
been baptized and then confirmed or taught in the faith. And, and so if you would like to come forward for a blessing, you can do that as well. But communion is reserved for those who have or who have been instructed in the faith. The Lord be with you.
may the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you through faith down unto life everlasting. Thus says the Lord, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Go in peace and joy, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.